Welcome back, everybody. My next guest is a Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient and the director of the National Institutes of Health. Please welcome to Alecho, Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins, good to see you again. Great to see you, Stephen. It's been a while. I've been looking forward to the chance to hang out with you. So have I. People at home may remember that uh, from our previous interviews that I've got a soft spot for uh, people, the NIH. That's where my dad worked when I was born in Washington, D.C. Actually, That's right. he worked under Fauci's office over there at uh, NIAD. Um, That's exactly right. We're all connected. Now, we just announced that we're going to be back in the Ed Sullivan Theater in three weeks, after after the year of the pandemic, uh, as the director of NIH, what's it like to see this country slowly beginning to emerge back into public life? Oh, it's wonderful, both as the director of NIH and just as a human being. And by the way, Stephen, so you're going to open it up in three weeks. Are you going to ask people to show their vaccination status before yes. they come in? Yes, you have to be fully vaccinated uh, to come in. But if you're fully vaccinated, you can come into a full capacity audience. And that's a wonderful example of the kinds of things you can do. My wife went to a Nats baseball game yesterday. Uh, first time she's been there. I was too busy, so I didn't get to go. But next time. And we've had people come to our house for dinner, take off their masks because they're immunized. We are too. We like break bread together. We have a conversation. We hug each other at the end of the evening. Oh, I've missed that so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, nearly half of Americans, uh, the CDC tells us, have received at least one shot. But vaccination rates are differing uh, widely by location. Do you think there's a chance that we will reach, eventually reach a herd immunity? It's a tricky concept, this herd immunity thing. And some people think, oh, it's this bright line and you'll just get to it and you'll step over it and you'll go, Phew, we're done with that. But consider our country is so diverse and you just alluded to that in terms of vaccination rates. You need to get 70, maybe 85% of people immune before the virus loses its grip on us. And you could imagine that might be not too far off for some of the places that really have the vaccinations going up quickly in the Northeast, for instance. Mm -hmm. And other places that are lagging behind, they may not be in that space. And that worries me that come the fall, we may have then more outbreaks, more hot spots in places that didn't quite take advantage of this moment to get yourself ready, get yourself immunized. This is a dividend that we should all embrace. Uh, one of the communities that's been uh, resistant to a certain extent is the evangelical community, especially in the south of the United States. You're not only a man of science, you're also a man of faith. What have you done to reach out to that community? And, and what do you say when you do? I am an evangelical Christian, which surprises people. The uh, director of the NIH uh, has this particular faith perspective, but I do, and it's a central part of who I am and what I believe. So I have done a lot of listening, and I think every person who's a little hesitant maybe has a different reason for it. There's certainly concerns about were the vaccines rushed. As somebody who lived this every day, I can tell you they were done with extreme care. And what we know about their safety and effectiveness is about as good as we've ever known about any vaccine. There's concern about some of the rumors that are out there that maybe this causes infertility and no evidence to support that at all. But also for believers, I think there's something about this idea that I've prayed to God to protect me from COVID-19 and I haven't gotten it yet. So God seems to be looking out for me. If I go and roll up my sleeve, does that mean I didn't really quite trust God to take care of me? I've heard that. Now, I think that one is fairly straightforward to think through once you put it on the table. Because does God only answer prayers by supernatural miraculous intervention? God does a lot of the answer to prayers through people or through taking careful steps forward. You put on your seatbelt, even though you're asking God not to let you die in a wreck that day. You, you put your child into a life vest when you send them swimming for the first time, even though you're praying they won't drown. It's just these kinds of things one does to basically provide the kind of protection. And in that regard, if you've been praying for protection against COVID-19, saying, God, where, where, where is the answer? Maybe it's these vaccines. Maybe God has worked through science, which I think faith and science are entirely compatible, to provide us with this kind of an answer. It's a gift, but you've got to unwrap the gift, and that means roll up your sleeve. Have you always thought that faith and science are compatible? 
Oh, no. Uh, I was an atheist uh, in graduate school, studying quantum mechanics, loving those equations, not having much use for anything outside of that. Didn't really occur to me why they would work. And then I went to medical school, Stephen, and I sat at the bedside of people who were approaching the end of their lives, and I realized our medicine wasn't helping them that much. And I saw the people who depended on their faith, and it puzzled me. And one of my patients asked me one afternoon, um, Doctor, you know, I've been telling you about my faith. What do you believe? I had no answer. It's the most incredibly penetrating, important question anyone had ever asked me, and maybe will ever ask any of you. What do you believe? I realized I better do some work here because I really didn't have any kind of sense about why believers believe or why atheists are atheists. I had sort of migrated in the direction of atheism because it was sort of convenient. And when I began to survey the evidence for faith, it blew me away that there was a lot more going for being a believer in God than there was for being an atheist, just on purely rational grounds. What a shock. You, you've called science a form of worship. What, what do you mean by that? Well, okay, consider that nature is also a gift from the Creator, that we as scientists have the opportunity to explore nature and see how it works using the intelligence that uh, we've been given through this amazing process of humanity arriving on the planet through evolution, by the way. Let's be clear about that. That was God's plan, too. So science is then basically our opportunity to explore God's creation and to marvel at it and to be in awe. When I'm a scientist and I discover something nobody knew before, that's like this rush of excitement, but it's also a moment of worship, like, oh, God knew that. And now he's given all of us a chance to begin to learn it, too. And if that's something that even is going to alleviate somebody's suffering, then I am truly blessed to be able to be part of that. So the lab can be as much a place of worship as a cathedral. We have to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with Dr. Francis Collins. <laughs> 